Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be back with you all in 2024. Uh, wait a couple seconds for people to be entering the room. Hi, Gail and Joan and Maureen and Elisa, Abby, Julie, Jennifer's, Jennifer's Otter Pilot, <laughs> Louise, Kim, Patricia, Wade, Nadine, Lynette, Jean, so beautiful to see you. Elena, oh my gosh, it's a power, it's a powerhouse here. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I'm Stacy from The Well. We also have Patrick and we have Bryce from The Well. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about mindful poetry moments, about what's going to happen today. And then we're going to turn it over to um, some gorgeous guests we have. So mindful poetry moments started as a uh, we wanted to create a companion program to our mindful music moment program which brings mindfulness and music to schools and we wanted to pair mindful creative prompts and poems particularly during april for poetry month uh, and then we have expanded to have additional gatherings so we started this uh, we incubated this with the gorgeous on being project and now we have created a lovely, lovely community that has continued ever since we started meeting in these Zoom rooms during 2020. So we're super excited you're here. The format today, if you've not been here, is that we're going to begin with a meditation. I'm going to turn it over to a guest to talk about a poem that she selected. We'll read the poem, talk about the poem, and then we'll receive a prompt. We'll do writing together, meaning we'll just take 10 minutes or so to write in our own spaces to the prompts. We'll come back and we'll, um, if anybody wants to read what they've written, we like to hear what's been generated. And then we'll get a final reading of the poem. We have the super exciting news uh, that the poem that is being featured today, Wondrous, is by Sarah Fraley. And Sarah Fraley, if you look real closely at your screen, you can find her. The poet <laughs> is with us. So we're going to hear a little bit from Sarah. We're going to hear Sarah's poem and the um, meta scenario of Sarah basically writing to a prompt about the poem she wrote from a prompt. So in a second, I'm going to introduce you um, to Ellen Austin Lee, who selected the poem and is going to be presenting the poem. But what I'd like to do first is just offer a meditation for us to get in our bodies in, the, in, in this room, in this moment. So I read the poem again this morning, cried instantly, um, and was really taken by an idea and a line in the poem that I'm gonna play with for our meditation moment. So take a second wherever you are in, in, in the world and reorganize your body, whatever that means for you to be able to sort of tell your body, your spirit and your mind that you're getting ready to try to uh, exhale and settle in for a second. So I usually do a little bit before I try to go for stillness, I do a little bit of looking around, gentle rotations, moving fingers, wrists, allowing some wiggles, some stretches before starting to drop into our seat, drop into our feet, drop into the here and now. 
If you enjoy closing your eyes to receive guided meditation, please do so. If you prefer to just keep your eyes open, I suggest softly moving your gaze at something in front of you that's not moving. And take a few big inhales and exhales with a heavy sigh. So much so you can hear your out breath. Big inhale, exhale. One more big inhale, exhale, audible out breath. And just encounter this moment. Your breath in this moment. Your body in this moment. There's a line in the poem or phrase, I should say, two words. <sighs> I'm okay. <sighs> I'm okay. So I invite you to think of a time where things were super stressful or are super stressful. You might even tighten your body to just put your body in a stress state. And then recall a time where you might have said to someone who was looking at you like, are you okay, are you okay? And you finally felt able to raise your voice and say, I'm okay. I invite you second to think about a time or the energetics of a time when you might have turned to a, a young person or someone who you're worried about. And what do you, when you say to them, you're okay, you're okay. Most of the time when we're saying I'm okay, or you're okay, we're softening our being. We're not yelling, we're talking slowly, softly, intentionally. And then I think the real medicine that we need in our world is the collective we're okay. So even if you're muted, I want to take us on an audible journey. So we're going to inhale and we're going to all say, we're okay. We're going to inhale again. And I want to hear you, especially the people I'm sitting in the room with. We're okay. We're okay. We're okay. We're okay. Last one, big inhale. Exhale and audibly say, we're okay. We're okay. All right, we're okay humans. Thank you for being here and I'm super happy to introduce Ellen Austin Lee. So Ellen is not a new poet, not a new lifelong learner, not a, a new space holder of people who love poetry, but newer into our um, ecosystem. And Ellen lives here in Cincinnati, has appeared in many literary journals and other places. She's had two chapbooks published. Um, she's a re received an MFA in poetry at the Solstice Low Residency Program, which I really like that, 
the sound of that. Um, and we're going to send you all of this in your follow up email so you'll be able to find Ellen and Ellen's work online. I want to say a little bit about Sarah too, since Sarah is here. Sarah is the author of five books, including Sad Math, which won the 2014 Moon City Press Poetry Prize. She has many books and has received fellowships from the NEA and the Saltonstall Foundation, and will be heading out for a lovely residency in Palm Desert um, this weekend. So we're very jealous for you going to the heat. And again, I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna share much more about Sarah and her, pro, her, and her work, but I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen to talk about the poem, Wondrous. Hello, everyone. It's so exciting to see all of your names popping up in chat and you're from all over, which is, really exciting. So I'm grateful to be here. I think I've been on this screen in, in the mindful poetry um, sessions with some of you before. So I'm grateful that I was able to curate the poem this month. So thank you, Stacy uh, Sims for um, giving me this opportunity and to Bryce Kessler for being the um, Zoom and tech person extraordinaire. And thank you, Patrick, as well, for being here. So um, I'm going to just, um, before the poem is put on the screen and um, I read it, I just wanted to mention um, that uh, why I curated this poem, um, Wondrous. Um, I honestly can't remember when I stumbled upon it, but um, I get a lot of um, poetry in my inbox. So um, as soon as I read this poem, it just really grabbed me. Um, you'll see why when I read it to you, but um, you know, it's, it's so relatable to what we all experience of um, about how memory enters our lives um, and just the most um, innocent of ways and really brings us down um, a path deep down a path of remembering people or events from our past. So with that, I think I'm going to just go ahead and have um, Bryce put the poem up so I can read it. And then we can have some time to reflect. Um, what I'm going to invite people to do is to raise your hand either electronically or um, visually, um, or put like comments or questions in the chat that we'll try to to get to, so we have some time to kind of really dwell with a poem before we start writing. So, okay, Bryce, whenever you're ready. Okay, Wondrous by Sarah Freely. I'm driving home from school when the radio talk turns to E.B. White, his birthday, and I exit the here and now of the freeway at rush hour. Travel back into the past where my mother is reading to my sister and me the part about Charlotte laying her eggs and dying. And though this is the fifth time Charlotte has died, my mother is crying again and we're laughing at her because we know nothing of loss and it's sad math. How every subtraction is exponential how each grief multiplies the one preceding it, how the author tried 17 times to record the words, she died alone without crying, 17 takes in a short walk during which he called himself ridiculous, a grown man crying for a spider he'd spun out of the silk thread of invention. Wondrous, how those words would come back and make him cry. And yes, wondrous to hear my mother's voice 10 years after the day she died. The catch, the rasp, the gathering up before she could say to us, I'm okay. It's wondrous. Oh, 
<laughs> I, I can't get through this poem without feeling choked up. That's my own sad math going on right now, which I, I think we've all experienced loss in our lives. So um, we all have our own sad math. So um, I wanted to open up the, um, give you a moment to look at, look at the poem. I'm going to maybe have uh, Bryce leave it up for a few minutes um, so you can look at it while we um, talk about it. You know, talk about what you see, um, how you experience this poem. Um, I know for me, what, what drew me in immediately was uh, really connecting with how just hearing a song or something on the radio or smelling something specific or, you know, different sensory things take me back um, to, to a specific person in my memory. So I'll ask you to put into chat um, any comments you have or raise your hand. Did I see? I think Nadine raised their hand. Thank you. I can't, I did not see that. Thank you. Nadine. Nadine, feel free to share. I think you're muted right now. Thank you for helping me through that moment. <laughs> I was muted. Um, this is about uh, um, not. This is about the construction of it. So I see one period at the at the end, and so that makes that makes. So I'm looking at this, going, "Wow, it's basically one sentence." I mean, not really, but it is because there's only one period. Do, do you know what I mean? And and so I find that I find that really interesting. Why do I find that really interesting? Because some people might say, well, why is it only one sentence? But I'm thinking, well, it's wonderful that it's only one sentence. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, like it's a flow of a flow of thought. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Yes. Thank you for sharing, Nadine. I see um Isti Toka, I think. I hope I'm pronouncing your name okay. Um Oh, you're, this is just a greetings. Okay. I'm um, sorry, Patrick. Uh, Patricia says, I'm lingering with the choice of three line stanzas, how it feels like the emotions are trying hard to be held and not spilled out. Thank you, Patricia, for sharing that. And then Patrick says, very Proustian. Patrick, do you want to elaborate on that at all or? Just leave that there. I just think of in search of lost time, you know, like the, you know, the famous moment of like, you know, eating the Madeline or whatever, having that rush of memory come in. Yeah, there, there's so much going on with the time in this piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then Jean says, um, says about um, the words sad math are so powerful. I agree with that, Jean. It's beautiful. Kara, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I can't find the icon, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, I love the part where it says, um, and though this is the fifth time Charlotte has died, like, because it never gets easier. I have a 10-year-old and we, we've read Charlotte's Web a couple of times. I can never get through it without crying. So I was like, oh, that's so, it's so true that when it's, um, because you're really right there. And I just love that the grief doesn't get easier no matter how many times you go through it. Yeah, it, yes. and the mo the mother cries every time she reads that that scene. Um, KG Monroe um, says, I think it shows how grief can keep you stuck in the past, but almost make you dread the future. It's a deep wound that never fully heals, but ages enough that you can live. It transforms you into a hard and cynical version of yourself that is kind of broken and tainted. Yes, that's beautiful. 
And then I saw earlier that um, Sarah said about the one sentence poem, that that was the prompt. <laughs> so success, Sarah. That's wonderful. Does anyone want to unmute and share what they put in chat or... Um, Jean, did you have your hand raised again or yes, I did. Yes. Um, so it was interesting cause I didn't really notice that it was one sentence until that was pointed out and listening to that, it made me think about how all of that could be just, just a moment in the day. So it's just one moment of my day. It doesn't represent this big long story of my entire day that these little moments of grief can come through and it may not be my whole day or my whole week or my whole month. It can be one sentence. It can be one moment. And then we can go on to the next moment since it was just one sentence, one moment. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Does anyone else want to share? I'll share. Okay. Hi, Holly. Hi, Ellen. Uh, I just think it's fascinating. The auditory recall from um, listening to the radio and, you know, the auditory is, is a really strong, you know, just like the olfactory sense in, in turning us somewhere. Someone mentions something and it takes us away from a moment as important as driving. We're no longer driving. We are now down a path that we haven't visited in 10 years in this poem. She's it's on the day of her mother's it's an anniversary, which is really strong for people um, surviving grief. So I just, there's so much um, grief language here. It's, it's just so powerful. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. Thank you, Holly, uh, Jennifer, and then Elena. So I was thinking about the fact that um, the one sentence also gives it a more liminal feel like one of those moments where you're just transported out of time. And there's a lot of conjecture that those are those moments where, wait, where did the time go is the spiritual space. And when you're getting conversation with grief, conversation with however you see gods or whatever. Um, and so that felt very much to me like it was a good reflection of the grief space which was one of the reasons it was really effective for me. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that. It's interesting, too, how the um, how uh, Sarah the Poet brings in the um, E.B. White, you know, the author's, um, also his experience of grief in this. Elena. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say when Stacy said, Think of a time when you were stressed. That was five minutes ago, trying to get to the hotel for mindful poetry. Mm -hmm. So um, the line that struck me was um, about she died alone without crying. It was, a, it was a very deep sentence for me. And my response sentence was, do we really die alone or do we meet ourselves on that bridge? That's my one line. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I, I'm honored you you rushed back to your hotel room to join us. Yeah, I had to fight the nanny brigade from all the kids being picked up from school. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay, does um, anybody else want to share anything else that they notice about the poem? Francine, do you have something to share? Yes, I uh, I was kind of experiencing the poem as kind of a time piece, like traveling and uh, mirroring her mother's death, but uh, the strong sense that she's seeing through the eyes of her mother now, uh, and that um, it's not just that she's remembering her mother, but that she's she's kind of immortalizing her you know, and uh, and almost saying like I I can visit you in this time or in this through this poem, I can remember you again. We can meet somewhere along the way through the lines of this poem. Yeah. Thank you, Francine. Thank you. 
I appreciate that. I love what everyone is seeing in this poem. And I, I, I find it also really interesting. There's this, you know, braiding going on between the, you know, the um, speaker of the poem's point of view. And then um, she's kind of looking back at, uh, she's understanding her mother in a completely different way as an adult, you know, looking back. Um, and then, the you know, of course, there's the, um, you know, you can tell that the, the poet went and looked up or at least um, read something somewhere about the um, author's experience of this, of writing the story. I found that also really interesting. It's a wonderful poem. So many great layers to it. So if this is um, a good time, I think if, if everyone feels like they've. Um, I think Lynette has something to add. Okay. Lynette, thank you. I don't, I don't say maybe Well, that'll be our last one for now. That sounds great. Actually. Hi everybody. Ellen just said it. I was going to say it's, um, it's not just a reflection, the speaker's reflection on a memory she has from her childhood, but her adult understanding of that memory. But you just kind of said the same thing that I was about to say. So uh, thank you for sharing this poem. It is really beautiful. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you. I, I apologize. I didn't see your hand up. So thank you. Great. Okay. Well, um, I went um, and put a document in chat just so you have it. To, you can just open that and or download it so you have it later to look at. It's got the poem. It also has a link to a YouTube video of an interview Sarah did with um, did with Katerina Stoikova of Accents Publishing, where she also um, uh, shares some of her other writing. I thought you might be interested in that. And um, the prompts are at the bottom of that doc. But I'm also going to just copy and paste the prompts right into chat. Let me see how they come out. It comes out, um, well, it, there it is. Um, there. It comes out kind of long. But I'm going to read it. It's it's not quite as long as you, as it looks. But um, so this these are the prompts. And the little paragraphy things are like the one, two, three. So they're options. So the first is... Po this is poetic leaping, this movement in time in the poem. So freely moves into the past or memory. As soon as she hears E.B. White mentioned on the radio, she easily takes the reader with her by using phrases like, I exit the here and now. And then she also says, and travel back into the past. So think of a time when you heard something like a song or a name or saw an image that took you back to a memory. Or you can invent a time if you can't think of that right now and then write what comes. Um, if it helps you get started, write, start with, I'm driving home from dot, dot, dot. That's right from the poem. Or I exit the here and now, dot, dot, dot. That's also from the poem. So you can also use any sense. You know, It doesn't have to be hearing you know, smell or, uh, you know, taste, touch. And then another option is to write about a memory you have that's tied to having a book read to you as a child or the book, you know, maybe you read it to yourself, um, something about the story. So what about that memory stirs emotion in you? Is it the relationship with the reader, the ritual of being read to, the story in the book, or your adult self seeing the story or the reader of the story with new eyes. So, and then if none of those appeal to you, just any word or phrase or line in the poem that jumps out and grabs you, go with that. And then always follow your muse, meaning ignore my prompts <laughs> and write whatever you want to write. And um, just at Ella, recently I was in a workshop with Ella de Castro Barron, who calls prompts portals, which I love. So look at these as portals into something you want to write. So that's it. Thank you. So I'll set the timer for us for our 10 minute writing response. Bryce will put the poem back up just in case you want to peek at it for a little bit more inspiration. Um, I'll give you a heads up a couple minutes before 
the end of the 10 minutes and we'll be back together in 10.
All right, everyone. Let's come back to one another. And Ellen uh, will be looking for your desire to read either by raising your actual hand, your little robot Zoom hand, or by writing in the chat that you would like to read. So I am looking. Oh, Jennifer, go ahead. I used um, the prompt of taking something from the poem, and this is called 17 Times. Mm -hmm. 17 times today, I reminded you of why I don't want to talk about how much I did or didn't sleep last night. 17 times we had that same discussion yesterday. 17 times I discussed the terror I experienced due to what that meant to me as a child. 17 times I grieve me as a child. 17 times you say, oh, I remember now. I don't want you to go through that. 17, 17 times I grieve you as an adult. 17 times I worry what this may portend. 17 times I wonder when they'll schedule your follow-up. 17 times I think about our future. 17 times I dip into the liquid of our past, remember the similar conversations we had with first your mother, then your father. 17 times I'm grateful this doesn't run in my family. 17 times I grieve that it runs in my sons. Beautiful use of the repetition, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, Isti? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, but sorry, I cannot open my cab now. I'm sitting on my chair and talking to my psychologist when I'm ready. Feel amazed how flowy I can tell every line every word of my dark birthday story back on December 31st, 2023, which is very surreal for now to be remembered because I've returned from my amnesia caused by a rat that hits my body and by a pair of glass windows that blinds my eyes. And now I'm back centering to the only truest present for my everyday birthday presence. Thank you. Thank you, Esti. Um, Kara. Okay, so um, I took the line, and though this is the fifth time Charlotte has died, and though this is the fifth time Charlotte has died, I grieve the newness of her loss of all their losses, the aunts, uncles, elders, my dad as he fades holding hands with Alzheimer's, the dogs, my faithful encouragers, the animals, my companions, the chickens hugging my chest, the rats on my shoulder, the cats between my ankle bones, the heavy headed dogs on my lap. Charlotte dies for the multiple time and I grieve my own losses anew from the safety of the page, from the safety of the barn from the safety of that dusty corner. Oh, Charlotte, oh, Jotty, oh, Diz, oh, Dane, oh, August, oh, Fee, oh, Ruthie, oh, Johnny, oh, Enzo, oh, Watson, oh, Dad, how I wish you all could have stayed. Wow, beautiful. Holly. Okay, I think I went with my muse. I don't know. Um, it's called the Marble Cake Cat. My cat's ashes live in small containers on my bookshelf. Stories all their own, alive in smoky bones. Missing are some of the stories that had gone long before I knew to keep them. And yet, nestled next to photographs that live on of small whiskered faces now smeared in memory and stacked in boxes, is the marble cake cat, a storybook so loved by my child self. Its tattered cover is molding 
from my greasy young hands and countless tears. Pages smudged and pulling against a broken spine, much like my cats were by the time they were threadbare and ready to live on shelves. The marble cake cat just wanted a home, a good home, wanted to be loved and lived many lives before finding the right one. And I feel that I've done that, that we've done that, each time we looked to homes outside of ourselves until we discovered the soft places we can offer our battered covers and spines. Thank you. Beautiful, Holly. Um, KG Monroe. Hi. Um, so the second prompt inspired me to write this. It's called The Memorial of the First Love. I depart through a crimson door with a golden handle into the mist. The minute his deep and earthy voice echoes across the room, the here and now dissolves into memories and dreams I thought that I had buried. But my mind never let it go, opting to keep my first scar, the symbol of sweet love turned into bitter regret. Now I'm falling like a monarch butterfly that has gotten too close to the sun, into an old body, into a familiar face, Beyond the mist, I tumble into the unforgiving dark, into a glass box replaying our past, as if it was an old TV playing a VHS tape, the same ending over and over again, a memorial of my trust and innocence. Thank you. Thank you, KG. Um, Lynette. When disaster befalls my wife, a slip on the ice, say, or a spill of hot coffee, she starts repeating to herself, I'm okay, I'm okay. In that self-soothing repetition, I can hear the little girl she once was forced to raise herself after her father's early death, followed by her mother's collapse under the weight of single motherhood. I can hear her telling her small self she's okay, not as a rushed parent tells us, needing it to be true, but in the comforting tone of someone who believes it. Her voice drops low and soft when she says it to me too. You're okay, you're okay, never singly, always an echo of tender reassurance. She teaches me how to remember we're all okay. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Elena. Hello again. This is called When. I read When Molly Was Six at age eight, and I thought, this is what it is like to be loved. Years later, I was nicknamed Molly. I embraced it. If a name could mean love, Molly was it. Being loved was a fantasy growing up. So I retreated into poetry in a world where love and death were synonymous because those that loved me died young. Now that I am old and on my birthday, I rewrite the story that goes like this when Molly was 68, dot, dot, dot. Thank you. Wow. So beautiful. Um, everyone took that those these prompts in such different directions. Um, did I did I get everybody that wanted to read? I think we have some people with oh, their hands up. Okay. I got my hand up, Francine. Okay, great. I just saw Elise, Alyssa, Alisa. I'll just say real quickly there's so we'll do Alisa, Wade, then Francine. And I think that should be everyone. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, um, the poem that was read earlier made me very sad because it brought back losses that I've had in my life. It made me think about how I would love to go back to a child-like innocence of not having experienced those things. Um, so I wanted to write something that was more happy or joyful, at least. Um, Walking through tall grass takes me back to my childhood 
in South Georgia, watching the tadpoles in the creek, blazing in the sun, chasing after butterflies, earnestly searching for four-leaf clovers, closing my eyes and blowing on fluffy white dandelion seeds, playing hopscotch and mother may I, roaming through the woods, watching the ants at work, hanging out with cousins and friends until I hear my mother yell out my name and I notice the street lights are on and I must go home. Did you say Jennifer was next? I missed that. I think Wade, Wade, are you, Wade, you go. All right. Uh, in 1978, when you're in the mountains, you are in the mountains. It's a 40 minute drive on barely there roads just to reach the saddest bar or the tiniest library. So what's at hand becomes a treasure. A decayed cabin in the woods lives a second life as a frontier outpost. The logging cut, now Lawrence's Arabia. Any book your favorite, dog-eared, committed to memory. The ancient telephone switchboard evokes Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. Behind it, Billy Mink keep, peeks out from an old box, tattered binding as, he him, as if he himself owned his stories. Outsmarting trappers and burglars along the Laughing Brook. I carried him for years, first in backpacks, then rucksacks, then orange crates, until eventually the mold and money and speed did their work, and the cover separated from book plate and pages loosened, and mountains became vacations and hot tubs and dinners. In 1978, if you were in the mountains, you were having an adventure. A million miles from civilization, camped under the stars at home. Wow, what a way to close this out. So powerful. Wow. Did um, Bryce and um, did did you want to just segue right into the to the final um, reading of the poem? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. so I'm just going to say, so we're going to hear from Sarah and um, in a second, but quickly. Um, oh my gosh, you guys are amazing. We're going to send you all things. We would love to receive some of those poems so we could put them in a place on our website so they live in in eternity via the website of the well. Um, and then next month, we have Wade Hopkins, dear Wade, bringing us a poem that we're super excited about. And then we'll be back with poems in April curated by Hala Liza Gafori for our weekly gatherings. So I'm also super grateful to Ellen for bringing this beautiful poem. And I'm so grateful to Sarah for A, writing this amazing poem and also having a Google alert for when her name and the poem shows up, which is how Sarah ended up in our space together. So Sarah, we want to hear from you and then read us, read us, read us to our next session. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much for uh, uh, the discussion was really interesting. It was sort of like being dead and being able to listen to what people were saying about you after you died. Um, but um, I just want to add to that um, Wondrous was written in a session much like this, not a Zoom session, but an actual live session based on a prompt. And if some of you were looking at the chat, it was a prompt to write a poem in one sentence. Um, uh, it didn't come out like this. I did a lot of work so that uh, uh, the function followed form, but you know, like this is what came up. Uh, this is from my book, Sad Math. Um, the Wondrous is the last poem in the book and it gives the book its title. So I will read Wondrous to you. I'm driving home from school when the radio talk turns to E.B. White, his birthday, and I exit the here and now of the freeway at rush hour, travel back into the past where my mother is reading to my sister, the part about Charlotte laying her eggs and dying. And though this is the fifth time Charlotte has died, my mother is crying again and we're laughing at her because we know nothing of loss and it's sad math. How every subtraction is exponential, how each grief 
multiplies the one preceding it, how the author tried 17 times to read the words, she died alone without crying, 17 takes in a short walk during which he called himself ridiculous, a grown man crying for a spider he'd spun out of the silk thread of invention, Wondrous how those words would come back and make him cry. And yes, wondrous to hear my mother's voice 10 years after the day she died, the catch, the rasp, the gathering up before she could say to us, I'm okay. Thank you. Wow. I just love you all so much. Ellen, we're grateful for the poem and you, Sarah, for you and the poem <laughs> and um, to everyone else for continuing to come back to this really nutritious, gorgeous space. So thank you so much. I can't wait for next month with Wade in April with everyone. Wade, tell us what are you bringing to us? Uh, Laura Riding Jackson. Um... I forget what the title of the piece is. Um, but we will send it via email tonight. You'll hear from me. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have Bye. A great Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, all. Special thanks, thanks to everyone. Sarah. Happy New Year. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.